this whole month of passion, fervor, and what that looks like. What does it mean to be zealous for God? What does it mean uh, to be zealous for good works? How should we be zealous for one another? I, I hope I at least touched on some of those questions and given you some answers. Uh, but today, I want to use three different passages, which is a little bit different from my usual preaching style. I want to look at three different passages, all from the same writer, the Apostle Paul. Um, and what does it mean to have misguided zeal? Um, what do we learn when we interact with people who have misguided zeal? Uh, what does it look like when I have misguided zeal? Those are some of the questions I actually might have answer or at least touch on today. Uh, so we're going to start in the book of Galatians. Um, so we'll look at it's just two verses here. Galatians chapter 1 is in verses 13 and 14. Galatians is a relatively short letter from Paul. It's just a couple chapters. Uh, it's one of his most fired up letters. Uh, Paul is angry, actually, at people who are saying you need other things than Jesus. And Paul gets pretty fired up, and he uses some of his own life's background of how he used to think you needed something other than Jesus. So this is what Paul now believes. So let's uh, read here Galatians chapter 1. For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. Now, few people today, I think, will resonate with Paul's actual story. Um, you know, he was zealous as a Jew. As, as he grew up, he became very zealous for a particular tradition of the Jewish faith. So there were Jews, and they believed in this Yahweh creator God who led them out of the land of Egypt and brought them to the promised land, Israel. All Jews believed that. But there were some nuances into what some believed. And so they had different parties. One party was called the Sadducee party. Uh, one party was called the Pharisee party. And Paul was very zealous, particularly from the traditions of the Pharisee group of Jews. Um, and he even makes a point, like, more than other people my age. I don't know if you guys have ever experienced that, where unlike other people in your age group, um, you are just particularly more interested in a certain subject. That's how Paul was for the traditions of his fathers. Um, again, I'm not sure too many people can connect with Paul's story in particular. Uh, Paul ended up, you know, killing people within the church. And I'm not sure too many of you have had that actual battle or that struggle. Um, if you have, I'm very interested. We should talk later. I don't think that's how most people connect with Paul. I do think, though, a lot of people connect with Paul's conversion of he used to believe one way so completely, and then, you know, he understood the truth. And this is what it ended up teaching me. So I'm going to phrase my first kind of takeaway like this. Misguided zeal can blind people from the truth. Because I think this is what happened to Paul. Right? He, he was so zealous as a Pharisee, so zealous for the Jewish traditions, he could not see the truth that Jesus was the Son of God. It's not that Paul was a wicked person trying to kill good people. Like, that was not his intent. He, he actually thought he was doing God's will by killing other people. This is not uncommon with history. Right? You, you look at the Christian crusades that took place in our own history. And Christians believed it is God's will that we kill other people. Like that, is, that is how they perceived it. We're going to go and get the promised land, the holy land, back. We're going to do this on behalf of God. Um, when churches broke away from Catholicism, um, there was still a huge struggle between church and state. And they still thought if you, so this is particularly happening, you know, Germany, north of Germany kind of area in the 15, 1600s, if you did not do church faith like us, 
then we would kill you. Like, this is, this is a struggle. It's not that they were inherently wicked people. I mean, again, we, we can talk about sin and its effects, but they killed other people because of misguided zeal, and they completely missed the truth. I think 21st century, we may not struggle with killing quite as much. Oh, but man, do we criticize and judge and attack? And when I say we, I mean collectively humanity, and even particularly people within church. Man, I think there is a misguided zeal that sometimes blinds people from the truth. So let me, let me backtrack for a moment and just define truth. I would define truth as salvation through Jesus. I'm just going to leave it very vanilla, very simple, plain as that. Misguided truth, then, means you need salvation in something other than simply Jesus. Um, and, and this could be anything from how to interpret the Bible to, um, you know, you need to do certain works in connection to faith in Jesus. Um, there's, there's a lot of things that people add to it. But I'm going to say the pure and simple gospel truth is that Jesus lived, Jesus died, Jesus rose, and you have salvation through Jesus when you believe in his lordship over your life. And it comes with practices. It comes with repentance from sin. It comes with the practice of baptism and declaring Jesus as Lord, washing away your sins. There's, there's things that happen with it, but salvation in its purest, simplest form is salvation through Jesus. Paul heard the gospel message. Um, he had to in order to define the church as people that he would kill, right? So the church is preaching Jesus lived, died, and rose, and you have salvation in the name of Jesus. Paul heard that message, and he could not see the truth of it because he was so zealous for the traditions of his fathers. And I think there are people, and you know them, they're your brothers, your sisters, your moms, your dads, they're your co-workers, they're your neighbors, where they are just so focused on whatever else they are zealous for that they cannot hear the truth of Jesus. And you keep sharing it. You keep bringing up Jesus. You, you keep mentioning church. You keep mentioning salvation. You, you, you might you know, talk about prayer. You, you try to sneak in a conversation if you can, but it doesn't matter how many times you say it, they cannot hear it when their zeal is so misguided. Why did Paul finally convert? It wasn't because someone convinced him that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. It's because his misguided zeal was finally stripped away when Jesus revealed himself to Paul. And so I, I guess I preach this in, in part to you to say our job as Christians like we're, we're trying to share the gospel with people. Some of the people we're sharing the gospel with are simply blinded from the truth. And there is no amount of preaching and teaching you can do that will change their hearts until the Holy Spirit strips away that misguided zeal. It's not an easy message, but I think this is the truth of what Paul's own journey was like. And if you've got your mind so focused on something else, it doesn't matter how many Bible verses you can show. It doesn't matter how many stories you can tell. Some people are just blinded because of this misguided zeal. If you can think of these people in your own life, maybe you've only experienced it a couple times, but if you can think of these people who are just so zeroed in on something else with misguided zeal, they're a challenge. Like they, they're tough people to deal with. Maybe they frustrate you, maybe they give you headaches, but like misguided zeal makes people particularly difficult to be around. Um, and I think it begs the question, how do we deal with them? How do we treat them? If someone is going to be so passionately invested in something other than Jesus, to the point that it blinds them from Jesus, maybe this even happens within the church sometimes, how do we deal with those sorts of people? Okay, I think Paul, he has been there. He has been the guy with the misguided zeal. Now that he's on the other side, as he writes, he can reflect on this. So I want to take you to the book of Romans. 
This is, I think, his thoughts on how we can interact with people with the wrong zeal. Again, I think this, keep in mind, these are not evil people, but they are people with misguided zeal. So I'm going to start in Romans chapter 9, because the end of Romans chapter 9 belongs in chapter 10. And I've told you guys before, the people who wrote down verses were not necessarily thinking of context. So don't, Paul didn't write numbers and verses and chapters. Humans did that way down the line. This belongs in chapter 10, so I shall read it with chapter 10. This is chapter 9, starting in verse 30. We'll read through the beginning of 10. It says, What shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it. That is a righteousness that is by faith. But that Israel, who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness, did not succeed in reaching that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as if it were based on works. They have stumbled over the stumbling stone, as it is written, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Now, if you ever pay close attention to my preaching and my teaching, you will know that I am a big believer in nuance. There is not black and white readings of most things in Scripture. You've got to unpack some things. You've got to work it out. You've got to see between the lines. I think... That's true for a lot of things. I want to try to offer a nuanced thought here about misguided zeal. So I'm going to phrase it like this. People with misguided zeal are our opponents, not our enemies. So I want you to think about all those people that I was trying to provoke you to think of. People with a misguided zeal. Um, and I want you to view them as God's people his created beings that he loves and desires salvation for. The reality is they are still opponents, but the reality is that they are actually not our enemies. I think this is hard to apply. I'm not going to say this is the easiest teaching that I've ever tried to preach or work with, but as you mature in Christian faith, I do think this is a teaching we do need to work on is seeing other people not as our enemies, but sometimes as opponents in a certain position, in a certain scenario, in a certain belief, right? So think of it like sports. Um, and I'll use another analogy for my non-sports fans too, right? But for people in sports, if it's a good, healthy sports competition, they are your opponents and you're trying to beat them. But at the end of the game, you might shake hands, give hugs, compliment the other players on how well they did. Like that's, that's the, <clears throat> I would say, ideal scenario for a sports competition of whatever kind of competition it is. They're your opponent. You want to beat them, but you don't want them grievously hurt. You, you don't want them to, to do terrible. Like you, you want a, a nice, clean game, and that's not always reality. Because some, especially within rivalries, um, there are people who they want the other side to get hurt. And they view them more as enemies than they do simply opponents. In the business world, I would say other companies that are in your same market, they function as your opponents. But in a you know, good, healthy business marketplace... Your job is to create a better product than what they are putting out. That's how you succeed. But I think there are a lot of people who want to take it in a very misguided fashion, and they want to sabotage your efforts. They want you to fail rather than for them to lift up. Um, let, let me use a church life, right? In church life, this could be people with differing doctrines and beliefs, right? There are thousands of denominations of churches, 
thousands of them. And we all are trying, in, in my opinion, to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And there are some other pieces attached to it. Our hearts as Christians should not be to beat those people and to fight those people because the people are not our enemies. They're our opponents. They're not our enemies. Satan is the one enemy that we have to deal with. And he's got his own forces of, of demons and evil, and, and he's twisted the hearts of other individuals, but he is, he is the enemy, the people that we disagree with, sometimes rather strongly, they're not the enemy, right? So I think of Paul here in, in this writing, he, he is looking at the Jews, and he's even looking at some who believe in Jesus, but they still cannot get past the law. The law of Moses to them, <clears throat> to them, excuse me, the, the law of Moses to them is still up here. Jesus maybe is there, but Paul's saying that when we have Jesus, like the law is gone, and it's just Jesus. And Paul says, so, so they work against Paul because Paul preaches Jesus alone. And this other faction preaches law plus Jesus. And Paul's comments is, guys, they've got zeal for God. They want to do what's right. But they're missing the point. Jesus put an end to the law of righteousness, and he became righteousness. And now we have his righteousness. I'll share two illustrations, again, of just helping you process through opponents and enemies um, in C.S. Lewis's second Chronicles of Narnia book, Prince Caspian, um, there is the prince, Caspian, who is trying to lead the Narnians, the good guys. Uh, he's trying to lead them against, I think it's the evil stepfather who runs the opposing kingdom. Um, and so he's trying to rally the Narnians. Uh, but he needs some help, and so he blows this magic horn, and that summons the characters from the first book, which includes the high king, Peter. Well, now you've got the high king, Peter, and you've got Prince Caspian, and they both want to lead the people of Narnia. And so I haven't read the book in a while. It's been, it's been many years. I've seen the movie more recently, and I think the movie at least depicts one of the scenes where Caspian and Peter are trying to work together to defeat the evil king, but they decide to take two wildly different approaches and it ends up hurting the whole Narnian forces that tried to, to follow them because one went left and one went right and no one else kind of knew where to follow. And, and they argued and they kind of pushed each other and there is, there is friction. I think C.S. Lewis is helping you know, unpack Caspian and Peter both want freedom for the Narnians. But they were acting as if they were opponents to one another and they were missing the bigger picture of who their enemy was. I think this happens in our day-to-day -day lives where we'll, we'll view people in the world, the, the people that we want to come to Jesus, but we can accidentally view them as enemies instead of opponents. Uh, next month on Netflix, they're going to release a live-action adaptation of a children's animated series called Avatar The Last Airbender. There is a character uh, in the animated series who has been disowned by his evil father. And the only way he's ever welcomed back home is if he goes and captures his father's opponent, the Avatar. Um, and so he is, at least through the whole first season of the show, constantly in battles with the Avatar because in his mind, if he can capture the Avatar, he can be brought back home, except for his home is run by an evil father. And it takes a while for the series to unpack your enemy is not actually your father's enemy. Your enemy is actually the evil father. Like, he's actually the bad guy in the whole story. But the son didn't understand that. He was just seeing opponents, and in his mind, opponents equal enemy. I, I guess what I'm trying to do with the nuance is to help you understand the non-Christians of the world, they are not our enemies. They, we, we might have opposing messages. We might have opposing beliefs. But they're not our enemies. The, the, the people who worship other gods, the people who worship other religions, Muslims, Buddhists, Hindus, they are not our enemies. They oppose our message of Jesus and Jesus alone, certainly. 
but they are not the enemies. Can we pull up verses 2 through 4 again? Um, or do I have 2 through 4? If I don't have 2 through 4, that's what I meant to put. Or 3 through 4? We'll go 3 through 4. Yeah, we'll, we'll do that. That's, that's what I meant to put. So that's, that's, that's the correct slide, right? It says, I bear them witness they have a zeal for God but not according to knowledge. All right, so let me again just apply this to people that oppose us. There are other religions that have good motives, good thoughts, good actions. They're not inherently evil people. They have a zeal, but not according to the truth. Again, I go back to the truth is salvation through Jesus. That We know that. That is the knowledge we have from our scripture is that Jesus is truth. Man, there are other people. I have known some really good atheists. They give money to people in need. They help care for other people. They're very self-sacrificing. They're good people. Honestly, there's a concept of a zeal for God. They just don't even know it. The problem is they don't have the knowledge, right? So they, they oppose our message of Jesus and Jesus alone. But it's not because they are wicked. I mean, they're sinners. I'm, I'm not trying to skirt around that issue. But they're not the enemy. He says they are ignorant of the righteousness of God, and they're seeking to establish their own. So again, this is where other religions come up with other methods of salvation, and a lot of them are based on you need to do something to earn your righteousness and eternal life, or whatever they phrase their end religion as. But this is what real truth is. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. So again, as I try to fan your flames of zeal, and as we interact with people with misguided zeal, there are people who just cannot process in their minds for whatever reason that Jesus is sufficient for our faith. But Paul says this is it. I've got nothing else to give you. It's just that Jesus and Jesus alone is your salvation. It is by his death and his resurrection that is what grants us righteousness. And so, as you interact with people in the world, whether they have a different faith, whether they have different political voting decisions and beliefs than you, um, whether they are a part of other countries that fight our country, they are not our enemies spiritually. They might oppose us in a lot of things, but they're not our enemies. Our enemy, our fight, that's with Satan. Because our belief is that God desires all people to be saved. And that means he wants everyone to come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Because that's how people find salvation. It's through Jesus. So Paul is going to put this, I think, really well in his letter to the Philippians. So we'll pull up Philippians chapter 3, and I'll end here, which is kind of a, a final teaching on Philippians 3. Paul is going to reflect on his own life, and he's going to talk about how Jesus is central to all of this. So this is Philippians 3, starting in verse 3. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh, though... I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If, anyone's th if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. As to the law, I was a Pharisee. As to zeal, I was a persecutor of the church. As to righteousness under the law, I was blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as lost for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection of the dead. And this is what zeal for God looks like to me. This 
this is what, what zeal for good and zeal for others is going to be defined as. It's, it's where you are going to sacrifice everything else for the sake of Christ. It's because all misguided zeal is worthless compared to knowing Christ. That'll be the final thing that I can leave with you. If I've been preaching on all of this zeal, it's got to boil down to the centrality, the centrality of Jesus Christ. Um, this might even sound a little harsh, right, for, for Paul to even phrase it like this. He says, all of the good things in my life, they are rubbish. They are trash. They are worthless compared to the knowledge of Jesus. It's not that all the good things in your life are worthless or trash, right? Love your family. You can love your jobs. You can love your sports teams. You can love your clothing. You can love your movies. You can love whatever you love. That's, those things aren't bad things. But if they ever get in the way of Jesus Christ, they're, they're hindering you, not helping you. There is one thing and one thing alone that is more important than everything else. That's Jesus and so anything you could ever be excited about, and it can be good things, right? You can be excited about a particular good work. Again, the Jews, they were zealous for the law of righteousness. And you might have to stop and say, well, how can trying to be a good person be bad? It's if you are missing the point of salvation through Jesus, then it's not good for you anymore. Salvation through Jesus. Zeal for your country, it's no good compared to Jesus. Zeal for righteousness in your own life, no good compared to Jesus. Zeal for money, no good compared to Jesus. Zeal for fame, no good compared to Jesus. Whatever you're going to devote your life to, it is going to be worthless if it's not Jesus first. Hey, you can have a good career, you can love your country, you can love other people and good works. That's, that is fine, if Jesus comes first. But if I can give you a teaching to walk away with, it's not that the things in life are worthless. It's just that they're all worthless compared to Jesus. Like Jesus is just that good. If I can encourage you to be zealous over anything in life, I don't want you zealous for this church. I don't want you zealous for my thoughts and opinions. I just want you zealous for Jesus. I want you to cast everything else aside and say, I consider my salvation to be my faith in the one who lived and died and rose for me. Man, this is as simple as Paul can put it. He says, everything else is rubbish. And he had, he had, a, he had a good resume, right? Like he, he listed all the things. He's like, I was actually pretty righteous and blameless under the law. I, I, I crossed the T's, I dotted the I's. I did it right by the book. And that is just not enough because Jesus is enough and you don't need anything else. Church, we'll offer an invitation for you that if you would like prayers of encouragement to fan the flames of zeal for Jesus and Jesus alone, if you've never made the decision to make Jesus alone your Lord and Savior, we'll give you the option that you can do that today and you can study with me if you want to find a different day to do it. But man, we believe that Jesus is at the heart of in center of our faith. He is our faith. Take away Jesus. We're not Christians. Jesus is our faith. Let me encourage you to be zealous for Jesus. If we can be praying for you in that way, you can come forward now as we stand and as we sing. I have